We are in part three of our series. The series is called Alignment. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians, written, remember, by Paul from prison to the church in Colossae. It was a message, a letter that encouraged them in their faith, but also corrected some false teachings that, um, as Steve showed us last week, so often begin to wash their way into uh, the faith. And that it, it had happened to the church in Colossae. Ultimately, the message that Paul was trying to communicate to the Colossians was to bring alignment, bring greater alignment in your life with Christ and with the gospel. And today we're looking at chapter three. And chapter three really brings chapters one and two together. Chapter three really shows us the how-to of how, we, how do we do chapter one and two practically in our lives. Chapter three just really opens it up for us and explains it in three different ways. In fact, it gives three areas of our life that we can practically align ourselves with the thinking and teaching of Christ. And we're just gonna get straight into it. I'm just gonna start, like there's not even gonna be an intro story to get you giggling. I'm just gonna dive straight in to this message, to my first point, uh, because Paul teaches us how to live in a new way. And he teaches us to do it in our inner life, in our church life, and in our home life. We're gonna start with the first one, in our inner life. Are you ready? Okay, Colossians 3, verse 1. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, Put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things and you, when you were living in them, but now put away all of the following. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language from your mouth. Don't lie to each other since you have put off the old self, with its practices, and you have put on the new self. You are being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of our creator. I have something, church, to confess to you today. And it may be a piece of information that could change your opinion of me, either for better or for worse. Here is my confession to you in the room and you watching online. Steve and I have an old life. We have a previous life that we once lived. And in that life, we were hip hop dancers. <laughs> For approximately eight years of our young adult life, we were in a hip hop dance crew. Actually, there's a, some ex-members also in the room today, but I won't name and shame called O2. We trained three or four nights a week. We performed on weekends. We toured New Zealand and Australia and competed in the Hip Hop Dance World Championships in Los Angeles in 2007. You may not believe it, but once upon a time, Steve could run up a wall and backflip off it <laughs> and land on his two feet most of the time. <laughs> That's right, we were baggy jean wearing, bandana wearing, side flat peak cap wearing hip hop dancers. Now I know what you're thinking, where can I find video and photograph evidence of such a life? Well, the bad news for you and the good news for me is that you can't. You can't because by the grace of God, it was a life we lived before anyone had a camera on their phone 24 seven. The thing is, that old life is so far removed from us that it's strange for us to recall that we ever really lived that kind of life. It's hard to imagine we ever did it. That life is no longer familiar. The movements no longer come naturally. You see, you can't find evidence of it because we died to our old life. Amen. And poor... <laughs> 
And Paul is teaching us in Colossians 3 that when we are aligned in Christ, you die to your old life. That life no longer feels familiar. That before Christ life is so far removed from you, it no longer shapes who you are. You can no longer find evidence of our life before Christ because your life has been transformed in Christ. It is so far removed. Our sinful nature has died, has been put to death and we are death and we are raised to a new life in Christ. Paul says, once you walked in these things, the sinful things, the things of your old life, once you walked in them, when you were living in them. But can you remember what Colossians 3 has been teaching us for the last two weeks? We no longer live in our old life. We live in Christ. And so now we walk in the things of Christ. We live no longer in the sin. We live in Him. And so we can put away the things of our old life. You know, when Steve and I moved into the house that we owned previously, we had to do a massive downsize. Like I'm talking, we used to live in three, we, we, we had rented three or four bedroom houses with multiple living areas. But with this move that we were doing, our, just our last house that we used to own, we were moving to two bedrooms with no garage. Like we were moving into a tiny home and we had to do an absolutely enormous cull of everything that we owned. We were sorting through everything, getting rid of a lot of stuff. And as we were going through our stuff, we realized that there were a few boxes that hadn't been opened since our last move. Anybody know what I'm talking about now? There's these boxes, they're still sealed and you're looking at it going, I don't even know what's in it. What we realized is that these boxes had not been opened for our last five moves. We had faithfully carried these boxes, moved them from house to house to house, to fa- from Auckland to Whanganei and back again. We were very faithful with stewarding these boxes that we didn't know what they were in. We realized that they were filled with our university and our teaching resources from when we both trained as teachers. Here's the thing. It was our old life. It was not a life we lived any longer, and yet we carried those boxes faithfully from new house to new house to new house. We were not willing to part with a life we had actually put away. And I think too many of us live with boxes stacked around us of old life thinking, old life ways, old life habits, things that we are refusing to part with. But in Christ, we have actually put away, and I don't mean put away, I mean put away, put away old natures, old habits, old thinking, old actions, old addictions, old prejudices. What old attitudes are you still carrying that you need to put away? What old resentments are you still moving faithfully from place to place to place that actually Christ has enabled you to put away? He's saying, put off the old self and put on your new self. So how do we do this? How do we live our inner life aligned with Christ in the new way that he's teaching us. Well, here's how we do it. We commit to transformation. We need to commit to transformation. We need to say yes to change from the inside out. We need to be willing to let God speak into the areas of our life that we need to just put away, that we need to put down and put aside. It starts at the beginning of every day. It starts in that moment you wake up in the morning and you commit your day to Christ. It starts in that devotion time, that time of prayer, that time saying, Holy Spirit, I need you today. I need you to come and fill me. I need you to transform my life. I invite you to be part of every detail of my life. It starts in those prayer times in the morning where you're saying, God, change me. Show me the things in me that are not right with you. It starts in that time in the Word in the morning, when you're looking through the Word saying, Lord, what in in these passages, what in these scriptures are you trying to teach me today? It's a getting up daily and saying, Holy Spirit, would you change me today? Would you transform me today? We've got to commit to transformation in our inner life. Good? All right, second thing. Here we go. Here's the next area that Paul talks about in Colossians. He talks about the church life. My church life, my church life with each other. Colossians 3 verse 12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord forgave you, so you also are to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity and let the peace of Christ to which you are also called in one body rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of God dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing Uh, one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul is trying to teach us about a new way that we can live amongst our church and faith community. This passage is about a faith community living together. And in verse 13, it uses the phrase, bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. Now that word bearing, when you look it up in the original language it was written, it means to hold up, to hold up. He then goes on to say, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. That word forgiving in the original language it was written means to show grace. You know how we very often use that phrase, can you just bear with me for just a minute? We say that, don't we? Or perhaps someone said it to you before. Maybe you're standing at the counter in a store and and the person behind the counter is taking a little bit longer than you would like. You know, maybe the receipt machine has run out of paper or maybe they can't find the barcode number. How annoying is that? I'm like, just scan something else. But you get a bit shifty. You get a bit shifty on the other side of the counter, don't you? And don't you tell me that the person, the poor person who's trying to get the problem sorted doesn't know. And what will they say? They'll often say, just bear with me for a minute. What are they saying? They're saying, can you show me some grace? Can you show me some grace? Can you give me a minute to do what I need to do? Can you just show me some patience? We often hear it as well when the person has to go away and come back again. They say, bear with me for just a minute. What are they saying? They're saying, don't leave. Don't give up on me. I will come back. Trust me. Trust me. I'm coming back. Stay with me. And I wonder if you, like me, can look back on seasons of your life and feel thankful for the people who showed you grace when you needed it. Perhaps we didn't deserve it, but they showed it to us anyway. Online, I wonder if you, like me, can think of people in your life that have showed you grace, even when you didn't deserve it, because I'm thankful for people in my world that have. I'm thankful for good friends like Laura and Rachel and Jenny, who when I have missed the mark and forgotten their birthdays, or I have been too involved in my own stuff that I forget to check in on them. I'm thankful that they have been kept showing up for me in my world, that they have kept being there for me and loving me and showing me grace. And I'm thankful for Sharon, who I've worked alongside in ministry for many, many years since we were young. I'm thankful that in times when we've disagreed on stuff and we have clashed heads and times when we have misunderstood one another, I'm thankful that she didn't give up on me and that she keeps speaking life into me and keeps showing me grace. And I'm thankful for Pastor Luke and Marilyn, our founding pastors, who gave me my first opportunity to minister and lead. I'm thankful that even in the seasons, or even now, every day, when I make mistakes, even in the times when I have stood up, I've probably said many heresy, heretical things on this platform and un- unintentionally. You know, I have probably stood up here and made a great big mess of things time and time and time again. But I'm thankful for leaders who didn't give up on me. I'm thankful that they kept believing in me and believing the best in me and calling the best out of me and showing me grace. Who are you thankful for? Can you think of those times when, and those people who stayed with you when times were tough. Can you think of those who didn't give up on you? We all go through seasons when we need others to hold us up, to stick with us, to not give up, to hold us up in the midst of our journey. Just two Sundays ago, we baptized a group of people, a whole bunch of people in all of our services. We baptized a group of people. And one of the people that we baptized was Susan, who's sitting down here on the front row. And 
I can remember when Susan and her family first visited our church. I can remember their first Sunday. And I can remember it really well because of the way that it impacted me. See, Susan is battling a severe illness. And actually today you can see she's in a wheelchair because many times she's too weak to stand up by herself. And on this particular Sunday, she was very, very weak. On the first Sunday she came in, very unwell. But during the worship, I looked to my right as we stood in worship, and I couldn't believe what I saw as her son stood on one side and her husband stood on the other side, holding her up to her feet, holding her on her feet when she couldn't stand herself, when she couldn't hold herself up, holding her arms up high in worship, when she couldn't hold her arms up herself so that she could worship God. It was the most incredible and beautiful picture of how a community of faith comes together to hold one another up in seasons when we can't do it ourselves to bear with us in our pain and our struggle, to journey through us and show each other grace. So how do we do this? How do we align our lives so that we can be a church like that? Well, we need to commit to community. We commit to community. That's why small groups are so important. That's why we don't stop talking about it. That's why you're sitting there right now going, oh, small groups again. Yes, We are unapologetic because small groups teach us how to do this stuff well. You can't learn this stuff on a Sunday in one hour. You learn it in small groups. There will always be people in your small group that are going to stretch you. There are going to be people in your small group that are going to, I heard that, mm -hmm. (laughs) mm-hmm. There are going to be people in your small group that require extra grace. There are going to be people in your small group that challenge your thinking. We learn the discipline of grace when we journey with other people. But it also, there is also going to be people in your small group who will hold you up when you can't stand. There are going to be people in your small group who do not give up on you, who turn up for you, who will stick with you through those toughest seasons. Here it is, the marketing plug. When you leave the service today, please go and check out the small group stand. <laughs> Pastor Tanya will be out there. She would love to sign you up. Just scan yourself a QR code. A QR code. Get signed up to a small group. You need it. Online, online, you can refer to the chat and it will tell you everything you need to know about signing up to an online small group. Third, third era of our life. We've got our inner life, our church life. The last one is our home life, my home life. Colossians 3, 18 says this, it says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children for that won't become that they so that they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched. Sorry, I just have to stop there because I'm I can't. When it says human masters, I immediately think of an animal master. Like, what's the, you know, I think, what's the alternative to a human master? I think of an animal master. I mean, I'm like, what? Wait. But it means the heaven, as, in, as opposed to your heavenly master who is God, right? Okay, got it. I just, too much thinking going on in my head. Uh, don't work only while being watched as people pleases, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from your heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the ward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done. And there is no favoritism. Masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly since you know that you have a master in heaven too. There we go. There it is as opposed to the human master or the animal master. Okay. Uh, We have to remember that at the time of writing this letter uh, to Colossae, it was a Roman city under Roman rule. And So it helps us to realize what a typical Roman household would have looked like at the time. It would have been a very authoritarian setup uh, in any Roman home. The patriarch of the family had control. The patriarch of the family held the power of life and death over uh, his wife, his children, his slaves, his servants. Like he held the power and the purse strings. So you can imagine how different 
the life and the way that Paul was describing to them in Colossians 3. Like this home life was different. He's trying to teach them the way that you know now of how to do family life is for is for the father, the the patriarch to have to be Lord and ruler. But you have to understand, Paul is saying, that when it comes to Jesus, with Jesus, the way is different. Jesus is now Lord and ruler of your home. When Christ becomes the Lord of your house, He wants to teach us a new way. He wants to teach us a new way to treat our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents, our employees. Paul reshapes the Roman household. He's saying, this is how you're used to doing it. But now that you are in Christ, we're gonna do it a different way. He's teaching, he's reshaping it around Jesus who rules with a self-giving love not an iron fist. This new way, this new way of living a home life, we must live for one another and not for self. I'm gonna ask the keys to come and join me now. Uh, One afternoon, our boys were uh, play fighting. They were play fighting with lightsabers. And uh, in another room from Steve and I, they're like, I can't make the lightsaber noise, but you know what? You know, it was very noisy. There was lots of there was lots of sound effects going on and lots of clashing and ching ching and like whatever and I, you know, <laughs> uh, all sorts going on. We could hear it. It was getting loud. It was it was very exciting. And then all of a sudden, there was crying. There was shouting. There was accusations being thrown. It was very dramatic. Very dramatic coming from the other room. Steve goes in to see what all the commotion is about. I stayed away, I stayed in the other room and I'm just overhearing what's going down. And and one of them says, he says, what's going on? And one of them says, he cut my arm off. (laughs) And the other one goes, but he sliced my stomach open first. This was Steve's reply. He says, boys, boys, boys. He says, do you know what the problem is? The problem is that you both want to win. And when you both yourself want to win, it always gets ugly. When I first heard him say that, I thought, well, of course they both wanna win. Who wants to be the loser? But his words made me think, because this is too often how we approach our relationships. We live for our own win. We live to make ourselves the winner rather than living every day so that they can win. And this is what I have learned from 17 years married to my husband. He has taught me this. If we each person would get up every day and spend our day serving one another so that they are their best, then we both win. We both win. And I think this is the kind of reshaping that Paul was trying to talk about to the church in Colossae. Wives, submit to your husbands. But husbands, you better love your wives. Kids, obey your parents. But parents, don't you frustrate your children. Employees, work hard, do your best. But employers, treat your people well. So how do we do this? How do we do this practically? What does it look like? Well, it looks like this. It looks like committing to self-giving love. We commit to self-giving love. There's this call to mutual consideration and love, a getting up each day and making a decision to make others in your world win. Not how can others serve me, but how can I serve others to give them everything they need to be at their absolute best. Paul teaches us in Colossians 3 how to live in a new way. He says, live a new way in your, in your inner life. How do we do that? Well, we commit to transformation. He says, live a new way in your church life, in your faith community. How do we do that? Well, we commit to community together. And thirdly, he says, we can live a new way in our home life. How do we do that? Well, we commit to self-giving love. Can I pray for you today? Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your word that teaches us 
and it gives us such clear instruction and examples of how we can live uh, an aligned Christian life well. And God, I lift up every person in this room today. And Lord, as just as they think over those three areas of their life, Father, everybody watching online, as they begin to, to think about three areas, I pray, oh Lord, that you would just come right now. May your Holy Spirit just speak to our hearts right now. Show us any of those areas, Lord, that we just need to bring some more alignment today. Lord, in our inner life, God, we commit to transformation. But God, would you show us anything in our inner life where we just need to bring some more alignment? In our church faith community, God, we choose today to commit to community together, but Lord, would you just show us right now, reveal to us any areas that we just need to bring some alignment. And in our home life, Lord, we're committing today to self-giving love. But Father, would you just teach us right now? Would you reveal, would you open our eyes to any areas where we might need to bring some alignment? And Father, as we do, I pray your blessing. I pray your blessing over homes. I pray your blessing over relationships, over marriages, over friendships. Lord, I pray that as people commit themselves to you, they would sense your presence closer as they align their lives with you, Lord. They would get a greater sense of purpose and hope in their world. God, that they would, they would know your guiding and your leading. Father, they would hear your voice clearly, O oh Lord. Father, we commit to these things today in Jesus' name. Just with every head still bowed and every eye closed. You know, we've talked a lot about Christ over the last three weeks, a lot about Jesus. And today we've talked a lot about how Christ can give us a new way, a new way of living. And there might be some people here today, in fact, I know there is, and I know there's people watching online today and you're saying, Bex, I don't even, I haven't even got this, this new Christ aligned thing. I'm, I don't even know God. Well, today, I just wanna let you know that God loves you. And He created you with a plan and a purpose in mind. And He wants nothing more than to daily live in a relationship with you in this new way of living, this new life we can have in Christ. But our sin, our mistakes, we turn our back on God, we turn away from Him. And that separates us from God, but God in His mercy and grace, He sent His Son Jesus to live a sinless life on earth and die a sinner's death so that you and I could find relationship with Him, have new life in Him and new life in eternity. And today I'm gonna pray a prayer and I'm gonna invite every person in the room and online if you wanna pray this prayer with me, you're saying, Bex, I need to commit my life to Christ. I need, I need that, that Jesus that you're talking about. I need Him in my life today. I'm not quite sure what it means. I don't know what it looks like. I, I really don't have all the answers, but what I do know is that I need Jesus. Well, today I'm gonna to invite you to pray this prayer. I'll pray it, pray it out loud. You just pray it along in your heart. We say, dear Jesus, thank You that You went to the cross for me. Thank You that You paid the debt that I was due for my sin and I choose your forgiveness today. Thank you that you have come into my life and made me brand new. The old has gone, the new has come. Thank you for the plans and the purposes you have for me. In Jesus' name, with every head still bowed and every eye closed, I would love to know who I prayed for. I'd love to know if today, whether you're online or in the room, if you prayed that prayer with me, all I'm gonna ask you to do is on the count of three, I'm just gonna ask you to lift your hand. You can shoot it up nice and high. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, I'll pop it. Uh, you can pop it straight back down. Online, there's a button that says, I raise my hand. You can click that button, I'll see it and I'll acknowledge it. Are you ready? Be bold, be brave. One, two, three. Hands can go up. You're saying, yeah, Bex, awesome, awesome, yeah. Thank you, yes. Anybody else you're saying, Bex, count me in? Yes, down the back, I see you. You're saying, Bex, count me in on that prayer. I prayed it. Maybe it's not the first time, but maybe it's the first time in a long time. Saying, I need Jesus in my life. I need to align my life with Him. Thank you, Lord. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Online, I can see you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you for every person that prayed that prayer.
Lord Jesus, I thank you that they have new life in you. Lord, I thank you for the plans and the purposes that you have for them. Lord, I thank you that they can live a brand new life now and look forward to eternity with you. And right now, as all of heaven kicks off in a party, we celebrate too. Come on, church, let's celebrate together. Wonderful.